Hello and welcome to the pod. I'm Nathan Fink. I'm Jolyn Drennan and this is New Hampshire Family Now. A show about building family in the Granite State. Today in the show, Rebecca Wojkowski of New Futures joins us to talk biennium budget, the kids' movie Bluey, and later I'm joined by Hannah Stoller and Candace Gordon of Marguerite's Place. New Hampshire Family Now is brought to you by the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. Since 1962, the Charitable Foundation has worked hand-in-hand with generous and visionary citizens to maximize the power of giving and support, collaborate, and lead innovative initiatives. Initiatives like New Hampshire Tomorrow, which is focused on making sure children and families have access to education, health care, and career pathways to ensure every family member thrives. To learn more about New Hampshire Charitable Foundation and all their initiatives, go to www. Dot nhcf.org. I am happy to welcome back Rebecca Wojkowski, Kids Count Policy Coordinator at New Futures. Rebecca, it's good to see you. It's been a while. Good morning. It's good to see you too. By the way, I did nearly hire Eric Stallwell's private investigator to see if I could find you. <laughs> I just wanted that person to deliver a few emails. Are you still alive? Well, I'm happy to report that I'm still alive. I've been working hard um, since the last time that we talked, but yes, yeah, yeah. I'm well. And as I mentioned, the school year is ending, so we are all approaching, I think, a summer where we'll be able to take, I hope, a collective deep breath. Uh, last time we chatted, you were kind enough to explain New Hampshire's budgetary process as long and arduous as it is. And I'm curious to know now, this many months later, where are we in that process? Well, um, I think a short statement around it is that we can kind of see the finish line. Um, so right now, um, at talking to you in this moment, where we are is that the House has completed their budget process, the Senate has completed their budget process, and now we are at committees of conference. So members of the House and Senate have been um, named to those committees, and they will begin to do their work with the hope to have a compromise budget done by the end of next week. So um, in looking at the total process, that means that the next step, once there's a compromise budget, if the two houses can agree, it will go to the governor who then has to approve the budget or veto it. So (laughs) in the marathon that is the budget process, we are closer to the end than the last time that we talked. And there's been a lot of movement um, around, you know, the issues that we talked about last time as well. So in these committees, you say they get to work. They're seated with people. We know who's in them. What does that work look like? Are we debating provisions? Are we trying to amend? Are we trying to align? What what does that mean? Yeah, so the goal is a compromise budget, which means that um, both sides will come together, um, sides meaning the House and the Senate, Democrats, Republicans, and identify key controversial areas within each budget. And the goal is to negotiate pretty much a settlement that they agree that this is an okay budget that fits um, political ideologies, that fits um, you know, the revenues, the projected revenues we have in the state, and that can move to the governor's office. So it's really back and forth negotiation around small things, big things within the budget. There are major differences between the, the budget that was passed in the House and the budget that was passed in the Senate. Can you outline some of those major differences? Because that lends itself to say, oh, man, uh, extended negotiation process and or kind of a volatile session around what stays and what goes. So in the House budget, there were huge gaps in primary prevention funding that have been filled, um, not completely, but filled in the Senate. So, um, you know, we hope that a lot of those things don't rise to creating partisan arguments around whether or not we should be funding supports and services for families and kids. But those are some of the top that are going to have to be addressed. You know, and additionally, in um, one issue that was in both of the budgets is the funding for SNAP incentive programs. So I'm hoping that that carries through, but we never know until, um, you know, those folks get together and start to discuss what is going to be an issue going forward in approving the budget. Quick definition, SNAP incentive programs. Can you outline what that is? Sure. So um, in New Hampshire, we have these programs, but we didn't have any state funding. Um, And the programs are for SNAP beneficiaries. They can go to local retailers like a grocery store or a farmer's market and get a dollar for dollar match on fresh fruits and vegetables. They're really great programs that um, help our farmers, they help our small retailers, and most importantly, they help our families access more fresh fruits and vegetables because we all know that actually buying those things are really expensive um, in the store. So um, it also creates this great community connection with children, meeting farmers, um, and you know, getting to be able to choose what they want um, at a farmer's market or grocery store. So New Futures helped um, with some of the coalitions working on uh, that this, this session as well. Speaking of little ones, I think I hear one in the background. Oh, yes. Um, you may hear a little one 
them pop up in the background as his school ended yesterday and we're watching Bluey. So <laughs> that might have come up too. If you haven't watched Bluey as a family, you need to watch Bluey. That's yeah. a plug that I'm not getting paid for. No, I am actually going to see if they will help fund this podcast based on that little placement you did for us. <laughs> uh, I was going to ask then, so these things had been restored because, you know, the gap was filled, you said, in the Senate. So whatever happened, there was a restoring of funds for those family supports and services. Is that true? Yes, um, to some degree. So, I'll, And I really want to thank everybody who took time. Um, if you responded to a new futures action alert, if you responded to my panicked email or phone call to make a connection with someone, um, you know, your legislator or to group people together to send an email, because we did have movement on some key areas within the budget for primary prevention. And that's around funding for our system of family resource centers and also community collaborations grant. Um, those dollars made it into there. We also had a late in the session funding dilemma around Medicaid home visiting that we were able to ensure that there was funding to implement that rule change. If you've been following the work that we've been doing for a couple of years, you know, we had a, we had a campaign to expand access to Medicaid home visiting to all Medicaid eligible families. In New Hampshire, there were some really tight restrictions around who was able to access that programming. Well, the rule change wasn't implemented. Um, and then during the Senate side of um, the budget, there was a, this request for additional funding. So we were able to work with our Senate partners and advocates to ensure that there was funding in the budget. But um, one area that wasn't funded was the request for Healthy Families America home visiting. So um, again, I like to tell this long story because that's the history when we're talking about how we fund primary prevention programming. But in 2019, um, the state legislature funded some programming through a parental assistance program. The idea was um, while we're doing work to transform our child welfare system, we really have to look at primary prevention and how are we helping families? And as part of that, they dedicated additional general funds to Healthy Families America home visiting in key targeted areas around the state. Unfortunately, the Senate did not um, approve those additional funds to carry forward for that type of home visiting. Now, it doesn't end our Healthy Families America home visiting program in the state. We still have our federal programming, but it does lessen the amount of services that can be directed to um, really at-risk, high-need areas. And I think that one of the things I'd like to you know, really talk about when we speak with our advocates and others who are doing work in this space is how do we ensure that we have the education in our legislature to understand the different programming around home visiting and primary prevention to have an understanding when we're saying, um, you know, New Hampshire has a portfolio of home visiting so we can meet families where they're at. That, that doesn't mean that it's duplicative and it doesn't mean that every family fits a particular model. So, you know, we really do need to make sure that we have a diverse portfolio of services for families um, so that we're really providing what they need. So unfortunately, that part of um, our funding request, we weren't able to uh, get that across the finish line. Um, we were able to make some movement on access to um, child care. So there is funding um, in the budget that is projected to serve all families that need it under child care scholarship with a couple of important footnotes. Um, so one footnote that if there's a waiting list um, or perceived projected waiting list on child care scholarship, that the state would be able to draw in additional funds to make sure that that doesn't happen. As well as a footnote um, that Senator Whitley really worked hard on to have the state try and implement um, enrollment-based billing um, instead of intend attendance space for a year. And that gets a little bit into the weeds, but you know, top level is that will support providers, that will provide consistency for families, um, because we know that uh, sometimes when the administrative burden is hard to access a service that the state has, it families are under so many layers of stress that they just won't access the um, service that's there for them because it's too hard. So we really want to start to, to break down those administrative barriers that families are facing so that we know, especially now, and you said it in the beginning, when there's more limited access to child care, um, that we're really helping families be able to um, get the services that they need to go back to work, to be thriving, to have a break. I think we can all say that doing the dual role of being a full-time parent, having a full-time job, and being at home, we are all under a lot of stress. Um, so we've just been trying to really work with our state partners so that um, we can 
make transformative change for kids and families within the state. That's right. And making sure, you know, those different component pieces of primary prevention are there so resources are, like you said, accessible. With regards to, say, housing, the, you know, and transitional housing and things like that, because, you know, child care is a component piece, uh, access to jobs and employment, education and stable housing, affordable housing is also a component piece and, and really contingent and foundational. Is there anything in the budget around funding for those agencies that provide it? You know, um, I'm probably not the expert to answer that question, but I can tell you that um, I was at the Council for Thriving Children's meeting um, earlier this week where Governor Sununu um, was there, and he mentioned there was a lot of federal relief around um, housing, but for a variety of reasons, um, it really wasn't accessible to Granite State families. So I say that with the um, statement that I think that there is an awareness, obviously, around um, the fact that being able to stay in stable, affordable housing is a key tenet in primary prevention for children and families. And I believe that there's work ongoing around that. Um, I think I can happily connect you with someone who might be a little bit more of an expert in that portion of the budget. You know, I have to say a quick side uh, uh, victory is I feel like I finally found something that you're not necessarily an expert at. <laughs> oh, gosh, there are so many things. <laughs> um, so we're we're this far then in the, the advocacy process. We're, we're, we're far along that line. You said we see the end. What does advocacy look like from here on out? So um, in the last stages of this, it is the continued attention and dedication to ensuring that, you know, we have communication and understand where important parts of the the budget process may be falling apart in those communities of conference. Um, but beyond that, it is really how do we continue to sing in a united voice around the fact that investment in our children is essential. It is not optional. It is not something that should sit on the back burner, but it is as important as anything else in the budget because this is our future. It is the foundation of how New Hampshire will be a strong state. Um, and it is something that I find often um, that kids can be dismissed when we're speaking about investments. Um, but we should be elevating investments in children and families to a top priority within the state. Um, and I really want to say that I, um, I want to engage in a thought process around how do we message and how do we best communicate to our lawmakers? What are we talking about when we say primary prevention? What do we mean when we say home visiting? And what, is, what are we saying when we mean, what is that to a family? So as much as we can elevate the story, um, as well as the buzzword that you might hear, the line in the budget, um, if there's one thing that I have learned is that um, our lawmakers are inundated with so many budget lines and so many programs that it's understandable why um, you might not understand how that connects to a family in New Hampshire, how that connects to a program. So I see more and more that my job is to elevate that story. So when they hear that word, they know um, that they're talking about, you know, this is a home visiting program that serves families um, in Colebrook. This is a home visiting program that serves families in um, Manchester. And I know what that means to that mom, that dad, that child, because I think that helps in the elevating the importance of um, securing those investments for a sustainable future. I uh, really appreciate you joining us again. Um, to learn more about New Futures, please go to newfutures.org. And Rebecca, I look forward to talking to you again. Yeah, thanks. It's always great to talk to you. When we come back, I'll be joined by Hannah Stoller and Candace Gordon of Marguerite's Place. Don't go anywhere. This podcast was brought to you by Nixon Peabody, who delivers exceptional legal services for clients in the community by combining high performance, an entrepreneurial spirit, deep engagement, and an unwavering commitment to a culture of collaboration, diversity, and humanity. Nixon Peabody works with universities, hospitals, and nonprofits of every size to maximize impact. For more information, visit nixonpeabody.com. Today's show was also brought to you by the Children's Hospital at Dartmouth-Hitchcock and the Child Advocacy and Protection Program, a multidisciplinary program with the Children's Hospital established to evaluate and provide integrative care to suspected victims of child maltreatment. Together, a team of physicians, advanced practice registered nurses, social workers, nurses, and child life specialists work to provide consultation and evaluations of children who are suspected victims of abuse, so to serve in the best interest of children and families at multiple levels of prevention. For 
For more information about Children's Hospital at Dartmouth-Hitchcock and the Child Advocacy Protection Program, visit www.chadkids.org backslash child dash advocacy. I'm thrilled to welcome Hannah Stoller, Executive Director of Marguerite's Place and Candace Gordon, Director of the Child Care Program. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So tell me a little bit about Marguerite's Place, its mission, history, and the work it does to help women and children achieve self-sufficiency. So Marguerite's Place was founded over 25 years ago uh, by Sister Sharon Walsh and Sister Elaine Fahey, who um, are nuns, uh, gray nuns of the Sacred Heart. Uh, who came to Nashua to, uh, uh, with the mission of supporting women with children experiencing homelessness. There was a great need to, uh, in Nashua for women with children, um, finding stable housing supports and being able to transition into self-sufficiency. Um, and while we've made huge strides in 27 years, that mission remains strong and that need remains strong in our area. Um, and what they did was they purchased, uh, 10 apartments on Palm Street, right downtown in Nashua, that are places where families who are in domestic violence and early recovery from substance use um, are um, having family issues or otherwise experiencing homelessness due to the myriad of reasons why people find themselves in those situations, um, can move in to a fully furnished apartment uh, that um, own lock and key, own washing machine, their own space for themselves and their child. Uh, they begin to work with our staff through supportive case management and coaching to um, work on a job or higher education or next step training, work on supportive parenting, and take steps towards their next permanent housing option beyond us. Families stay here for an average of two years. That used to be a really fixed number and kind of a magic number, but we've really seen that evolve over the years with the evolution of what housing looks like in New Hampshire. Um, sometimes that's one year for a family, and sometimes it's up to four years for a family. We also purchased 10 condominium units that are scattered throughout Nashua because we were seeing a need for families who were ready to move on from this phase one kind of emergency housing, transitional housing setting, uh, who are ready, have checked all the boxes, moving towards their next steps. But there was a gap in affordable housing back then, uh, now almost 20 years ago. So we all know how that's been going. Um, but those are condos that uh, are rented at less than um, half market rate, are full leases, uh, and so families can move there and continue to work with us more on an independent basis, but at least once a month, month have set goals that we work on, and families stay up there for up to five years as kind of phase two after Marguerite's Place. Um, and in addition, a huge component, probably our biggest program is also our child care program. Um, which started at the beginning of Marguerite's Place back in the early 90s. Um, and I can let Candace talk a little bit more about that because that's her baby. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think that when we first um, became Marguerite's Place, one of the big things that the sisters recognized was that it was important to support every aspect of the family, the mom, and what they need to be doing to get on their feet to, to become self-sufficient. And one of the big things is having a quality, affordable child care program that you can bring your children to and you feel confident in the care that they're receiving because these are the same people that are supporting you in other aspects of your life. Um, so we opened at the same time that the um, transitional living program opened. And that sort of slowly evolved over years. Um, it was recognized that we could support public families, not just resident families. So um, I want to say close to 10 years after we opened, we opened to the public as well. And we have continued to support public families that resemble the families that live here in a very big way. They've come from traumatic situations, domestic violence, as Hannah had said, living in um, you know poverty level um, and looking for other opportunities to become self-sufficient on their own. Um, it's been interesting the number of families that have come to us for child care needs that have eventually moved in and become a resident on our program. Yeah. Um, some of the um, ways that we really try to support the families here is to have um, a very trauma-informed lens around the care that we provide, knowing that these children could have experienced themselves or witnessed some of this domestic violence that you know mothers have been exposed to as well. And then also really building on the social emotional curriculum. We all know that that is um, the end-all be-all for children to get to um, a better place 
when they hit that academic world. Um, and, and our children are very special in that need, as well as the, you know, the trauma that they've experienced. As I hear you talk, I keep thinking like, you know, based on the longevity that people stay there, two years on average, phase one, up to five years, phase two, these things are based on opportunities that exist out in the community. So there's this interplay between housing, child care, and opportunity. And I'd like to explore that a little bit. How do you view that triangle? And how is that triangle doing? Yeah, we see a lot of families who they need all of these pieces. And if one before coming to us, if one tiny piece is pulled out, everything falls apart. It's often the reason that people show up at Marguerite's place in need of housing. They were working. They did have housing. One piece fell apart and they lost their job. And because of that, they lost their housing. And it's really this domino effect that's Mm -hmm. triggered that um, as a single parent without, you know, generational wealth or without community supports, things can fall apart really quickly. I always like to say to people that you are much closer to experiencing homelessness than you are to becoming a millionaire. And that's true for 99.999% of the population and that it is really a series of events that happen that can get people there within a year, within six months. And so we, that was part of the foundation of Marguerite's Place was understanding that the women who move in here, you know, we have requirements of people being back to school or back to work within a a certain period of time, but that's on their own list. They know in order to thrive and be able to support their family, they need that. And so very quickly, it became apparent to us that we need to offer childcare if we're going to expect that of people. Uh, I think a piece of that triangle that wasn't named, and maybe you can talk a little bit about family support group. I think it's more of like a 15 point star, not a triangle. Um, I think the unsung hero and something that's not talked about enough is community connection and social capital for folks. If you pause and think about when COVID was shut down, when the world shut down and people need to find childcare options like this, people ask their neighbors, call their mom, Mm -hmm. um, could call their friend and they could come up with a babysitting schedule or figure things out on their own. If you're really isolated, have experienced a lot of trauma, you likely don't have that network of uh, reliable people in your, in your back pocket. And, you know, if you're a shift worker and showing up every day is really important and your child is sick, and you have to stay home, um, that could mean losing your job. And so one of the things we've also focused on is helping people build community and providing both fun educational, um, you know, family fun nights and also educational options and support group options where people can connect with folks who are experiencing the same things as them um, in order to build that um, mm-hmm. social capital. Um, so a few years back, we implemented a family support group that looked like family style dinner with children and moms and teachers who were staying a longer day to help support the, the child care aspect of that. Um, and we also brought in Dr. Ben Garber. He is a child psychologist um, in the greater Nashua area. And what, what it looked like was child care families, public families, resident families who weren't even in the child care, all of these people coming together um, in a space having, having um, dinner together at these little kid tables, um, really just like laughing and sharing stories with each other. And then when, when dinner was done, the children would go to another classroom with teachers and Ben would sit with moms and say, hey, what's going on now? What, you know, what success did you have this week? What, what did you struggle with? And conversation would evolve very organically. Um, there was never like a topic or theme for any of these. Um, it was just like a real true support group and the connections that were built with these families, the resident families and, and child care families that would never have come in contact with each other in any other way. It was absolutely amazing and super successful. And it was one of the big things that we have been hearing since we had to close last year for our three months that we closed for, that these families were really missing that connection. We're really hoping that in 2021, we can kind of get back to something like that. Yeah. It's interesting because loss of childcare affects 
every aspect. Loss of housing affects every aspect. Loss of social connections and social network affects every aspect. Have you seen trends, you know, and if you're lucky enough to get into stable housing to, God forbid, purchase stable housing, you're now in a financially precarious place based on the cost of that housing. Yeah, great question. Um, I highly recommend uh, there's a report done by the state of New Hampshire every year on um, trends in homelessness in the state by different demographics. And it's really interesting to look at. So New Hampshire is actually doing a really good job in reducing veteran homelessness, single adult homelessness, and chronic homelessness. And that's because those have been uh, focuses of HUD, and there's a lot of money coming in to uh, combat those issues, and we're seeing results. The numbers are there. What type of homelessness is on the rise is family homelessness. And the challenge with that is, one, it's harder to document than a lot of other types of homelessness. Homelessness for families might not show up as homelessness in systems because they're staying with family members, moving from place to place, doubled up on couches. We've served families who their kids are staying with a relative and mom is sleeping in her car, all sorts of things like that. Um, and uh, we also see this um, this trend in terms of housing that there are also, we have a number of childcare families who are not residents here, who are just over income level, just, just over income level to um, qualify for any type of housing benefits um, or other types of benefits um, that makes their childcare scholarship go up, things like that. And being over income is really making like $35,000 a year, which is as a single parent with one child, not enough money to rent the market rate apartment in Nashville. You know, 30% of your income is considered going toward your housing is considered balanced in order to rent that room. Still require someone 50 to 60 percent of their income, not to mention the cost of you know all sorts of other things. So it really is a challenge of ours in that I believe that every person experiencing homelessness or housing instability is worthy of housing. I'm not saying let's hit these subcategories of homeless against each other, but it's a moving target and it's harder to there are less resources because a lot of our families fall in gray areas where they're They've experienced homelessness, but they're not quite chronically homeless as defined. And so they can't qualify for these types of vouchers. And um, they've experienced uh, this and are in need of all this other stability support, but they won't qualify for Section 8 because they're over by this amount. And so it is what we do is serve the in-between population. Uh, One of our strengths and challenges as an agency is we don't receive major federal funding in any sort of way, because we see this gap as our founders saw this gap 25, 27 years ago, and this gap is on the widen of, it's really, really hard for um, families with young children uh, to, who are low income to make it work in Nashua. And um, again, where there are lots of great federally funded programs that our families just miss the mark by you know, $5,000 a year, or um, they don't qualify for chronic homelessness because they stayed with their Aunt Betty for three months last year, and it hasn't been a full year of chronic homelessness. And so, uh, but they're no less in need than the folks who do qualify for those programs. So I think that's a big um, trend that we're seeing. And we are hopeful that with the um, money that's really flooding into the state right now through CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan, that there will be some more flexibility in who can receive those types of vouchers and funds. I'm hopeful that that's starting to evolve, that we're seeing, you know, what, uh, who else is in need? Because the direct numbers show in that report that those have been the vouchers that have come through the state and they've reduced veteran homelessness by over 50%. They've re- reduced chronic homelessness in single adults by over 50%. Because when you get the vouchers and those permanent supportive housing options, people, like we said, that the the triangle or the 15-point star starts to balance because right. they have layer one. So now they can focus on a job or they can focus on their mental health or on parenting. Um, that's that's kind of what we're seeing. The, the city of Nashville and the state are trying to do some creative things. Um, around that in um, landlord incentives to accept vouchers or, um, and I'm hopeful that we're going to start really getting at this from a different angle in the next couple of years. But 
that's, in my opinion, why transitional housing is so important because it really is designed for families, whereas the safety nets that exist in terms of housing really aren't designed for families or accessible to families. Yes. If you focus on it, you know, the data coming back shows that you do reduce certain rates. And so let's focus on this because the adverse experiences a child must have in an unstable situation where your, your housing is not, it's it's in flux. If people are interested in helping Marguerite's place in any way, how can they get in touch with you and what kind of opportunities are available to be either volunteering, sponsoring, donating, what's out there? So I actually have a great volunteer story that happened just this week. We have been really slow to um, bring our classrooms back up to full capacity just because of the pandemic and we wanted to make smart choices. But everyone here at Marguerite's Place has been vaccinated and we're feeling um, a lot safer about it. So as we build up the classrooms, we recognize that it's time to start bringing some volunteers back into the classrooms to support the teachers and the children. I threw out something on social media on Monday. Um, we need baby rockers. And I got no less than 50 emails of people wanting to come and rock babies. Mm-hmm. There are a multitude of ways to help like that. Um, we have project-based volunteering, so building and putting things together. That's project-based stuff. And then, like I said, supporting the classroom. We also have volunteers that come in to make lunch for the children, the child care program. And in terms of uh, donating, yeah, you're yeah. talking to me about a big portion of what I do every day is mm-hmm. uh, fundraising to keep these amazing programs operating. Uh, we rely very heavily on the uh, donations of our local community and we're incredibly grateful that we have such a strong base of supporters who've really been supporting Marguerite's Place since its inception, which is not always the case in nonprofits. Um, so that's pretty cool. We have a long history with folks. Um, there's always the opportunity to donate um, on our website, marguerite'splace.org. There is a big old donate button that you're welcome to press at any time. Uh, we have an Amazon wish list. One of the things Candace hasn't mentioned is we provide uh, free diapers and wipes to any child who is in our child care program, any resident family at any time. For our resident families, we also provide laundry detergent, food if needed, toiletries, toilet paper, paper towels, sheets, everything. So that they can, any of that extra money they don't have to spend can go into their savings so that they can plan to move forward. So we always have a uh, Amazon wish list on our uh, website that people can click and uh, have things shipped directly to us so we can continue to support our families in that way. Uh, and then we also have a couple of giving opportunities. We do have corporate partnership opportunities where companies can sponsor a childcare room, an apartment, a condo, um, or a family for a year at different levels. And that can look like a one-time bigger gift, or um, they can split that payment up on a month-to-month basis if they prefer. And we also have monthly giving options that if you want to be one of our sustainers that you can um, donate at different levels that have different meanings to us and what what that goes to support. So we really, I know this is a a trite phrase, but um, we really could not do it without all of the people who um, support us. So we would love for anyone else who is interested and wants to come for a tour and learn more about us who's considering donating or volunteering or just wants to know more. We're um, really open to tours of who we are um, right now. Yes. Well, may that mask socially distance aspect go away soon. This has been such a great conversation. Thank you so much, Hannah and Candace, for being here with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Nathan. For more information, go to marguerite'splace.org. Many thanks to New Hampshire's Office of Social and Emotional Wellness for sponsoring this podcast. Started within New Hampshire's Department of Education, the Office of Social and Emotional Wellness consolidates policy development and implements projects and programs that are focused on health and wellness with an emphasis on behavioral health of all students, youth, and families. To learn more about the Department of Education and its many programs and approaches, visit www.education.nh.gov. New Hampshire Family Now is listed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and more. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or ask your smart speaker to play New Hampshire Family Now.